All right, now we are going to pivot and look at a couple of startups coming from, oh, INSEAD alumni, just not any alumni. These are all both serial entrepreneurs. And first, we're going to bring back Jan Lachelle and find out what does it mean, privacy by design. Please, Jan Lachelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so let me make sure. Okay. So I was a student 17 years ago. Who's a student here? Okay, good majority. Did you know that I paid 27,000 euros only? <laughs> it's called inflation. Uh, but, you know, so you can read uh, the notes about me, the tidbits and the anecdotes, but um, since you're here, I'll make it worth your time. Uh, so I'll start with a history lesson and then teach you about a framework. How's that? So, yes, I am an entrepreneur since INSEAD. In fact, um, I started four or five companies since. I sold them all, so that's my track record. None of, well, none of them uh, very well, but nevertheless, I, I survived my entrepreneurship uh, career uh, with, uh, with stride. So I want to tell you about uh, computing at large, human-machine interactions, and I promise you this will be quick. Computers started off being shipped with humans inside. Computers were as big as a room, and people were actually operating the machine as part of the deal. Then a decade later, you had to have a degree, probably a PhD, to operate those machines with cardboards. And then a decade later, these are the inventors of Unix. Uh, the machines had actual storage, so it was easier to interact with them. But still, you had to code without knowing much about the interaction at that stage. A decade after, you had terminals, so what you typed, you could see. Every decade, there's a new paradigm in interaction with the machine. A decade later, some of you might remember this time, MS-DOS. You don't need a degree, but you need a hell of a lot of patience. <laughs> um, command line interfaces, right? Makes it possible for people to operate those machines at home, the personal computer era, but still complicated. The graphical user interface, a decade later, invented at the Palo Alto Research Center, which was the inspiration for the Mac, which was the inspiration for Windows 3.1. Now, this brings a new paradigm shift in the interaction. We operate business objects that are represented visually. Uh, still complicated because there's hand-eye coordination. You have to use the, the, the mouse to move objects around. A decade later, pocket computing. Remember the Palm Pilot, also known as the personal digital assistant? So of course, before that, there was Newton and Apple and all that, but convergence, a decade later, this. Now, this is a decade ago, and a paradigm shift in convergence. And I repeat the word convergence because Steve Jobs, when he launched the iPhone, said a phone, an iPod, a browser, the full browser. And he said it three times, if you go back to the, the keynote. So convergence, nothing special, except that he seized the convergence of multiple uh, technologies. So I'd like to talk about the next three decades, put them in perspective, and I will conclude my history lesson. So here you can see that on the graph towards accessibility, you go from punch cards all the way to command line, graphical user interface, haptic, which means touch, which is smartphone interface, uh, voice interfaces, augmented reality, and I will not talk about the singularity. Um, but accessibility means that you can address a wider population and therefore a bigger market. Now, what's interesting is to note that voice interfaces are probably on that axis for the next generation. And on this graph, you can see that the more advanced, the more accessible the interfaces, the more AI you need. Because ma machines will adapt to you contrary to what used to be. They used to be artificial. Now they become natural, right? So again, distinguish accessibility to market share. Some of that technology may not be accessible to everyone. That's a different topic. Now, I built just for you a four-part framework uh, to look at the situation. And the first one is platforms, right? So platforms, you know them all. And uh, they play in this unique triangle where you have corporations, states, and citizens. Now, corporations, we know, we studied that. They want to build and maximize quarterly profits. That, that's how they work, effectively. And states, typically, they want to maximize, hopefully, general welfare. Individuals, however, are usually alone 
uh, in that process. They don't have a lot of tools, uh, sometimes called democracy, but in any case, they want to maximize personal options. So the center of gravity is largely pulled towards the bottom. Problem is that these companies are in a very select club. It's a billion, uh, billion user club, if you wish. Um, they've been building up over the past decades and they've harnessed so much power that you cannot conceive the world without them uh, and you cannot conceive your business without them. Now, some platforms are not like the others. They are on top and others are upcoming. So give them a few years, there'll be a billion users under their world. So what happens with these companies? Well, they compete with each other. Right? As soon as one platform creates something that, which is a little too dominant, they go on the same turf. In fact, some of them failed. Google Plus just admitted that it's not going to work. Amazon failed will with a Fire OS. Um, Microsoft failed will with mobile operating system. Right? So it's a, it's a vortex, essentially. And these two platforms, they don't have an OS, so they created messaging, which itself wants to become a platform. trillion dollar valuations. So their objective is not, not just maximizing quarterly revenue, but also protecting their trillion dollar valuation. And that creates a very specific environment. Call it oligopole, call it monopole, it's all the same. Um, but the point is they yield tremendous power on consumer choice and on technology. So some of these platforms are therefore, in my view, black holes. We talked about data. These Technology companies, they harvest data and they don't share so much. So some of them are trying to be better corporate citizens. They do initiatives to give back in some ways. But generally speaking, they are so far advanced that that's their behavior. It gets worse when you have police states that take advantage of that. And in the EU, we could argue that we have a different momentum where we try to re-empower consumers by making sure that some of that data or some of that strength goes back to, to the edge. Part two, consumer power. So again, consumers individually, we don't have much choice because our digital life is being commanded by powerful platforms. That being said, uh, people are concerned. They are concerned, for instance, in the case of voice assistants, about their data. When you speak your Alexa, your voice is being streamed to Seattle and then it comes back with the instructions. So people wonder, right, because it's a new model. So what happens? Some people say generation Y and Z doesn't care because they are used to sharing data. Right? That's not true. If you ask around, privacy matters tremendously. And also resilience. What happens when there's no internet connectivity? Right? These platforms are built in the cloud. In fact, these platforms, Google, Amazon, were created when the cloud emerged as a platform. Right? So today we have a new momentum and I will explain. Now, very small case study here. You all remember SMS. You all remember WhatsApp, which is a modern SMS built over the top. Now, these platforms had no encryption built in. Every message you send over text is being read by the operator or can be read by the operator, therefore read by governments or anyone who wishes to just tap in. Now, WhatsApp conveniently didn't encrypt anything. What happened next is that a little guy here called Telegram, uh, built maybe by hackers uh, in Russia, built end-to-end -end encryption conveniently. But the thing is, this is more or less the same product. Feature-wise, it's the same. Now, they reach 200 million users, not all of which are hackers or terrorists. That's a problem for WhatsApp because that's, that's threatening their business model and domination. So therefore, they, they had to adopt encryption. So in a way, consumers have the ability to tilt the balance. And the final type of momentum swing that you can witness is also the fact that in the past 20th century, adoption of consumer technology came from the workplace, right? Companies had the means to bring innovation. Today, it's the contrary. Innovation comes from the consumer workplace, and we have to thank the Google and Amazon and Apple of the world to bring technology home, which means that corporations have to adjust to consumer behaviors that comes from B2C. Remember five years ago, bring your own device? Right? This is the IT department saying, okay, I give up. Okay, you don't have to have a BlackBerry. You can bring your iPhone. So new momentum coming from consumers, which means we have a choice. And by doing that, we can rebalance a little bit this equation. The goal is, of course, not to give anyone 
the full advantage, but to have something balanced because you know what? In our democracies, in our capitalistic you know, uh, transactional model, we value choice. And monopoles, oligopoles are the enemy of choice and therefore the enemy of value creation. Part three, this is a trend in fact. Remember I told you the history of computing over 70 years? There is an underlying trend which can be mapped here. Some of these trends across different types of technologies, different types of data schemes, have already moved from closed networks to internet. We have that. There's a slight regression, you could argue, with uh, siloed content because the World Wide Web that uh, Tim Berners-Lee invented in 1991 has slightly regressed with dominating platforms. But a lot of the other uh, technologies are being adopted to strengthen this momentum, which decentralizes technology and makes it a little more robust, a little more distributed, a little more uh, diverse also. So we can talk about databases becoming blockchains, right? It's a, it's a way to actually spread the risk and spread the information, multiple stakeholders. Thin clients, the Minitel is a thin client, a web browser is a thin client, but uh, you can easily turn it into an aut autonomous device. And IoTs is typically that, objects that operate at the edge. Edge computing, I would argue, is the new cloud. Get used to it. Finally, exponential technology. Now, you know this quote. You know this quote. This one is mine, you can quote me, but it's just the inference of the two. Uh, I tend to agree that AI is going so fast that it's likely to eat the world. Now, to be you know, very clear, and you've heard this probably uh, many times today, AI is just a family of algorithms. What's very fascinating today is the deep learning part. Uh, you all know about this. What is fascinating is that the best experts in deep learning didn't predict that this would happen for another 10 years. So the best experts, not you, the best experts, were wrong by a factor of 10 years. And three months ago or six months ago, they built an algorithm that built the algorithm that won against a champion, a thousand games to zero with no human supervision. To me, and I've been eating big data for breakfast since the past seven, 37 years, I've been doing AI since 1992, it's a shock. Exponentials are just too big for one lifetime. So it's, it's really, really fast. Moore's law, exponential, some people say it's plateauing, yes, fine. Moore's, Moore's law plus big data plus AI, still exponential. And this is us versus high tech. So there's a, an issue here with timing. AI being on a fast momentum, rapidly progressing. So regardless of my ability to understand the technologies, the algorithms, even code them, uh, I feel the crunch. There's a split in my guts that makes me feel that we are on the verge of a paradigm shift as well. So all in all, uh, I urge you, and this was said earlier, to understand not this black box, but this toolbar of algorithms. All of you will get to use AI in one way or form uh, for all of your businesses. It's fine, it's not that complicated. You have data, you have data that you can buy, you have data that you generate, you have algorithms that correspond to certain categories of uh, problem solving, so use them. And you can share the slides if you wanna dig down. So, in a nutshell, disruption and opportunities if you are able to ride this wave. So, let me tell you about voice. Time is ticking. Voice is the fastest adopting technology since sliced bread. Um, faster than microwaves, faster than radio, faster than the car, faster than TV, faster than smartphones, faster than Xbox. Um, Siri came first, but then Amazon is taking uh, the leadership in the, in the void, in other words, the kitchen. Right? Your smartphone is in your pocket, not necessarily where you want it in the house. And so um, Amazon Alexa pioneered that void because they failed, remember, with the uh, Fire OS? Uh, and so they managed to get a leg up on the other platforms. But of course, Google, fearing to lose search, built its own smart speaker. They never meant to build, build a smart speaker, but they had to. And guess what? Apple never meant to build that, but they had to. Because of course, if Google dominates the home, what about you know, the high margin uh, product that they want to sell? Then of course, other countries, this is South Korea, they have two providers. And then this is Japan, version for kids. 
Um, this is, of course, a couple weeks ago, actually last week, Facebook, of course, now they're getting into voice because their thing is messaging, remember? But what if Alexa becomes the reflex? Who owns messaging? Voice is coming whether you want it or not. Marketing budget, unlimited marketing budget, will make sure of that, right? Using all sorts of practice, dumping. Here's a Alexa speaker, take it away for free. Now, this was 2017, we're well over a billion today. The decade we've had with the smartphones, we're gonna have the same with smart speakers. And therefore, voice everywhere, in every device. You can imagine, this is a simple use case for music. The smart speaker is great for listening to things, music, so you can just ask for it. Multimedia, perfect. I challenge you to do this with your rem remote control, <laughs> right? The voice is perfect. Uh, this, of course, very natural, using an interface to actually map your journey or uh, you know, organize uh, your next lunch uh, on, on the way. And of course, robotics, uh, ideal for aging populations, typically Japan, where uh, there is uh, an acceptation of the robots, uh, culturally speaking. And brands. Of course, if the assistant can be built into the service, then why not build the voice according to the mascot or uh, the person uh, who's representing the brand? So yes, you talk to Coffee Machine and George will deliver. <laughs> so this is the question for all of you business-minded, uh, a billion dollar question or more. In other words, with what's happening with the platforms, what are you gonna do about it? And are you doomed to become a satellite of those platforms, therefore relinquishing your ownership on brand, on client data and so on and so forth? Well, we are a breed of new companies that believes in, uh, in the alternative and we can do that. We are working on an alternative for voice. So SNPs, company based in Paris, um, using voice to make technology disappear. Our vision is based on, on an older vision called ambient computing. Ambient computing is in the air. Um, and so company based in Paris, 73 people, mostly research, development, recently uh, sales. We started a year ago selling the product, raised 22 million euros all in all, two rounds. Uh, seed funding of three, uh, three million in uh, subsidies and, and uh, loans, and then recently 12 million euros in, uh, in funding, plus credit tax and so on for R&D. These are the founders, our CTO. I'm the only one without a PhD, but I do have an MBA from UCL. <laughs> so this is our mission, to make technology disappear and put an AI in every device. We're thinking on device autonomy not a centralized model. Voice turns out to be twice as efficient as any other input method. Why? Because we are a reptilian initially and we have voice plugged in and programmed since 100,000 years. Uh, text is actually only 5,000 years old, right? So we're much better at voice. And therefore, a voice assistant is broken down in multiple modules. The wake word, just like a first name, if I know your first name, I can call you by first name and therefore I get your attention. Wake word, ASR, transcribing sound to text. Uh, this is a very unique piece of technology uh, that we, we have also built uh, ourselves. Natural language understanding, turning, turning text into intent. And then the business logic, which may require a dialogue. So we're very careful. Uh, conversational interfaces are for tomorrow, sure, but today, you know, there's the IQ of the average assistant is about 20. So conversation may be for later. But today, a dialogue might not be required. When you ask a, a computer in natural language to do something, if you get a, a clean signal, beep, that means yeah, done. That's enough, no dialogue. Uh, conversation, yeah, maybe later. And Google is well uh, positioned to actually do conversations at, at scale. Um, and it takes a Google perhaps to do that. But today, uh, these interfaces are not so sophisticated. And so we built the entire chain um, from scratch and uh, we've managed to shrink it so that it runs on device, on a tiny computer. So I have a short demo upstairs if you're interested. Uh, Real-time performance on a tiny $30 computer, no cloud dependency offline, therefore GDPR compliant. So there's no data. So we can embed it on device. Again, edge computing is the new cloud. 
That's a new trend. The company was created when the edge is about to emerge. Google was created when the cloud was about to emerge, right? Generations. And we have a secret recipe here to build up uh, performance and we increase performance by narrowing the use case. We want to speak all of the languages. By 2020, we aim to cover precisely 50% of uh, all native languages on the cloud. This is a grid that we build, of course, it's green on our side, designed that way. But um, uh, we are unique in the way that we do on device. And we partner with powerful uh, platforms. So we're integrated in some objects like this one. This is a home robot that you can speak to and it will follow you, follow you around the house uh, and, and provide you with multimedia. So as a business study, uh, I give you a choice. Do we want to be a moonshot or a trillion dollar opportunity? This is a map that uh, analysts made and uh, correctly identified us at the bottom left corner. This is what we achieved um, with 100 man years of R&D. So barrier to entry is high, but still reasonable. Um, and this is what we achieved with Series A, the last round of 12 million euros. This is interesting. Now this is the big play. So that's what we're doing. We're raising funding again, uh, and we're doing also an ICO. We have 16,000 developers who have registered because you cannot compete today if you do not have the support network to build products for your technology, with your technology. So we have 16,000 developers, makes us the biggest platform um, after the Google and Apples, but probably the only one with this size of a community for embedded development. So we have tools, we are now embedded in those plays, and that's a triple play, right? As ambitious as it gets, basically. Uh, we'll see if we succeed. So I'd like to give you a sneak peek, one minute video, and we'll be done. At SNPs, we believe in privacy and openness. That's why we build open source voice technology that doesn't send data to the cloud. Today, in our quest to push privacy respecting artificial intelligence to everyone, we're building SNPs Air a voice assistant for your home. In fact, SNPs Air is not just a single device. It is an ecosystem of devices that seamlessly talk together and give you access to voice features from everywhere in your home. The devices work in a decentralized way, forming a mesh network based on the AirNet protocol. So it won't matter which device you're speaking to. Features can be added from our open skill store based on the blockchain. It gives your assistant virtually endless capabilities and ensures that all transactions happen privately and securely. And of course, everything runs entirely on device. This makes SNPs Air the first truly private by design voice assistant. Because what we say at home should stay at home. Hey, Snips. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time for, someone got a question right here. Yeah, I got a mic. If, uh, if, if you're not sending data back and forth, like data in the cloud, you're sending data to the grid, how does it get better? How does the, if, so the question, Hello. Yep. The, the question was, if you're not sending data, if you're not collecting data from customers, then how does it get better and smarter? So customers are human beings, and we collect data from human beings to build voice models. So they don't have to be the clients and the users. Right? We buy data from professionals that tag data with their voice to create a general model around human voices. Split the recognition from the business processing. If the function is local, there's no reason to ship your voice to the cloud. If the transaction requires web connectivity, of course, you do a web transaction, as you would. That's it. Mm. All right. Uh, one more, and then we'll have to move on. Yeah, right here. Hi. Can we talk about the 16,000 developers that are connected to SNP? Yes. So we, we focus on IoTs, and therefore the prime target for us was to talk to makers. Makers are developers that play with technology that is hardware-centered, uh, so people who play with Raspberry Pis or Arduinos. And this community is, uh, is very independent in spirit. 
And so they bind to our values and they bind to our technology, which allows to build a voice assistant you know, by themselves at home with 100 euro uh, total of hardware. Uh, and they can build today, you can build today a voice assistant for your kids that doesn't send uh, data to the cloud. You can build a, uh, a quiz in English or in any, any language. Yeah. And one last one for me, when is the ICO? The ICO started three weeks ago. And when does it close? It will close next year. All right. Uh, so it's a supplemental revenue. All right, very good, thank, thank you. you. Jan Lachelle.